I have the honor of presenting our first honored speaker, Dr. Lawner. Uh, Dr. Lawner attended his residency at uh, Albert Einstein Montefiore, uh, followed by a fellowship at HSS, and um, has been at a number of institutions in New York City. Currently, he is um, at Mount Sinai in New York City and is chief of pediatric spine and mini minimally invasive scoliosis surgery. Dr. Lawner. Thanks, Lionel. Uh, thanks for the invite. It's great to be with all of you, and I apologize for the jacket. Matthew, you and I have to get rid of these. Uh, great talk. Uh, so I'm going to touch on the non-controversial topic of vertebral body tethering, Steve, um, particularly as it applies to the older child. First, we'll talk about standard indications and then where, where we might go with this. And uh, my wife and I, Nihal and I, were just in Lanai, not Lanai, but Lanai, because I think Lanai means porch, uh, something like that. So, uh, beautiful island. So my disclosures are uh, within the program, but clearly, as we just heard from Matthew, uh, the standard of care for the healthy adolescent with a healthy spine, except for the fact that there's a deformity, is arthrodesis. Um, and we can, at times, delay this uh, by getting the patient a skeletal maturity, and then perhaps treating them in adult life. Um, and I'll show a little bit of uh, information on that. And then, or we can treat them now. And oftentimes, we're compelled to treat them to address uh, increasing deformity, et cetera. And the natural history of that fusion uh, is largely based on the lowest instrument at vertebra, which I'll discuss. So for me, as I've now entered my 28th year in practice, um, we're not most of the time addressing life expectancy in, in these moderate curves for that adolescent. You know, that's more an early onset problem. Uh, we, we clearly want to minimize complications and morbidity of the procedure. We do want to correct deformity. Steve's point about the rib prominence is really well taken. But also for me, I think the pinnacle is preservation of motion. Um, and this uh, pictorial of illustration of where we've been and where we, we're going, where we, are, where we are now, is I think very, very instructive. The Harrington uh, introduction of Harrington instrumentation was game-changing and revolutionary in our armamentarium for the first time, allowing us to use uh, metallic implants to correct curves. But that, with that came a lot of problems. And so we've evolved over time to shorter constructs, selective fusions, pedicle screws, and you know high implant density. But along the way, we got into anterior fusions. And these were shorter fusions, small incisions. And many of these patients did very well. Unfortunately, we had a, a higher pseudarthrosis rate. And then pedicle screws came along. And we kind of migrated to that. But now we're doing uh, thoracoscopically placed uh, vertebral body tethers uh, with very similar technique, uh, except avoiding fusion. And, you know, we don't fuse hips and knees very often anymore, and perhaps there's a role to avoid that, at least in some cases in the spine, uh, for uh, AIS. Uh, we looked at, uh, you know, surgery now versus later. This is one of the questions families ask. Their daughter or son is skeletally mature. What is the natural history? What if we wait till later? So we looked at adolescents and then compared them to uh, adults who had undergone gradual curve progression over the course of their lifetime based on the Weinstein curve progression data. And, uh, you know, we found that the operations for the adult counterpart with similar curve types were much more impactful. More levels fused, one third of the time fused to the sacrum and including pelvic fixation, more blood loss, more operative time and five times the major complication rates and three times the reoperation rates. And then you can see, you know, more blood loss, more levels fused, et cetera, et cetera, higher complications. Also, when we fuse the adolescent, this data is from about 100 patients uh, in the harm study group, of which we had 10-year uh, follow-up in this group of patients. And uh, we looked at radiographic markers of disc degeneration. And when you fuse to L4, more than a quarter of the patients had significant disc degeneration. So these are patients in their 20s at, largely at this stage. And it was a 10% rate of disc degeneration that was significant 
at this stage for LIV of L3, 7% for all comers. So already at 10 years, we're starting to see some disc degeneration. Most of this was asymptomatic. So perhaps you know the thoracal lumbar spine is where the focus of tether should be in part because of that data. But we also see some of our patients, and I treat adults as well as kids, and so I see my own patients 10, 20 years out and other surgeons' uh, patients. And so sometimes we'll have a, a result like this. This is a girl, a young woman now in her 20s, 27, I think, 12 years post-op. Maybe we could have done a better job in restoring kyphosis, uh, but she's got a lot of neck and low back pain. And here's a, a patient from a, a, another colleague uh, the older hybrid construct, and this with an LIV of L2, and at 40, age 40, 25 years postoperative, she requires a revision to the sacrum. Now, we know that with fusion, patients are able to move, and they can get into their sport. You know, I think some of them can go out and surf, but surfing is different for these patients. If you get on your surfboard and paddle out, you can't extend your back as well. But if we look at flexion and lateral bend, the patients make up for what's lost above by becoming hypermobile below. And I think that's why we see some of the disc degeneration occurring uh, at 10 years follow-up and, and thereafter. We also know that some patients with a more caudal LIV will not return to their sport. So certainly saving levels is helpful for sport and uh, flexibility. And so the promise of, of vertebral body tethering Maybe it's the ultimate procedure, maybe not, but is that it is motion sparing, uh, shorter recoveries, less blood loss. In, in nearly 500 cases, we haven't had to give one blood transfusion in any of our uh, pediatric patients. Um, it, it, you know, fusion remains on the table, and maybe we'll find over the course of time there'll be less adjacent segment disc degeneration. So uh, this is a motion sparing procedure, and I think we have a video if we could just click on that. This is a young lady is a daughter of an ICU uh, intensivist uh, who uh, brought his daughter to us. And five weeks post-op, she's playing tennis. And I, I, I know my fusion patients don't do this. So Noel Larson has also shown some preservation of the arc of motion in uh, thoracic tether. About uh, 20 degrees or so is preserved, 21 degrees. So it may not be important for all patients, but for some, particularly the surfer, for example, might be helpful for those patients. And I think over time, it may be impactful. Um, and she also showed that uh, the that preservation of motion clinically was even greater for lumbar tethers with uh, 17 degrees of coronal arc in lateral bend and uh, 30 degrees of inflection extension. So there is meaningful preservation. And I would just say this uh, cadaveric study by Trobisch's group in Germany shows similar findings with uh, flex, flex extension, axial rotation, really largely uh, in, uh, maintained, just 13% decrease in the cadaver. And uh, lateral bend toward the tether, slightly decreased. Uh, lateral bend away, a little more so. But a lot of the motion is preserved. And in this Turkish study, a small group of patients comparing tether versus fusion uh, there's better trunk endurance preservation in the tether patients than the fusion and, uh, and clearly more range of motion for these patients in the lumbar spine. And this is the collage of kind of some of the patients that flock to this procedure, swimmers, dancers, cheerleaders, and, and others. And the, it comes out of the, the concept comes out of the seminal work of Ian Stokes in the rat tail where he uh, you know, showed that the hoiter volkmann principle plays out when you asymmetrically load the rat tail, and then there's a asymmetric growth, wedging the vertebra, scoliosis is, is created, and this can be then corrected. I didn't get into a lot of the basic science for this talk. So when we speak to families, we, you know, and assess the patient, look at the curve size, flexibility, location. You know, we may want to push the limits a little bit for thoracal lumbar curves, but clearly skeletal maturity is important, and then family philosophy. We want something simple, straightforward, something that we know is a one and done largely. That, that's probably gonna be fusion for that family versus preservation of motion, which may be less predictable. But we're not going to generally take on large curves, 
that are stiff. And, you know, for the most part, we stay away from skeletally mature. But some of you know that I've pushed the envelope on that because there may be some remodeling that occurs. A lot of the deformity is in the disc and not even in the vertebra. But there may be some remodeling if you can hold the spine straight for long enough. Some of these patients may do well even with little growth, little or even no growth remaining. But this is the standard operation for a big curve and you know it works very well. But I can foresee a future and I've done some of these where we might fuse a little shorter like maybe we could end at T12 and tether below to L3 instead of fusing to L3. Uh, maybe that's not practical from a, a health economic standpoint, but I, I like it for myself uh, or my own uh, family. Um, so I think the ideal patient for tether is uh, around Sanders 3, um, probably 3, 4, maybe some uh, more advanced. Um, curves that are between 35 and 65 degrees. And, you know, again, if we're gonna consider this for patients after the adolescent growth spurt, there's gotta be shared decision-making about what's known and what's not known. And we'll talk a little bit of that and show some data. So uh, the standard best patient, moderate curve, you know, not a very severe curve, but this, this is uh, progressing despite bracing. He's got some pain, it's affecting his swimming and we take this on, and he's got some broken tethers in there uh, at two years, but he's held up very nicely. And then, sorry, here's another one, 50 degree curve uh, out to two years uh, with really nice uh, deformity correction. I think in some cases you don't get quite the rotational correction, but in others you do. And uh, here's a girl at the lower end, but with a, a larger curve, uh, and Sanders two, risks are zero, so there's some risk of overcorrection, but here she is out to five years and, and her rotational deformity corrected quite nicely um, with a very flexible curve, and you can see here her clinical outcome. Uh, so, and here's, a, you know, I'll try to show a number of cases with uh, as much follow-up and long follow-up as possible because the key is not what happens in two years, five years, it's gonna be 10, 20 years in comparison to what a spinal fusion looks like. But we can really see uh, for a thoracal lumbar curve, for example, 16 degree lumbar deformity, rotational prominence corrects to two degrees. And I see that a lot with these, particularly in the lumbar spine where they correct very dramatically. Um, and this is my first patient. I operated on her in 2015 in November. Uh, very active patient, and you know the family knew she was my first patient. Um, and here she is at one year holding her bilateral tether very nicely, and here she is out to five years. Um, there's some breakages in there, but she's held up really well and done very nicely without a fusion. And I kind of like the breakage of the tether, and then it's even more normal spine. So this was first approved by the FDA. We used this uh, approach uh, off-label before then. Again, in my practice, 2015, Larry Lenke performed the first one 15 years ago or 20 years ago now. Um, and Peter Newton, Amr Simdani, Randy Betts were all involved earlier on. I thought it was crazy. I thought it was all gonna fall apart. And so I held back a little bit and you know it, it's not falling apart. But I'll show you some other data that you know with very poor, unacceptable outcomes. And I, I think my outcomes are a bit better, not because I'm a genius, but because I step back and I let the other surgeons go through the learning curve. And I think that's why we, we've had uh, different kind of experiences. Uh, so these are the approaches. I do a mini open uh, procedure where we, we do a four centimeter incision here. It's tiny, you can look in though, and I can get five screws in through that. We can undermine the skin and put a portal above or below within that little skin flap. And then we'll use a portal above, a 15 millimeter portal and a five millimeter anterior portal for the scope. So it's really, I would say minimally invasive. And then I do a thoracoabdominal exposure for the thoracolumbar curves. We take the diaphragm down, but the incisions are a lot smaller than what we used to do for anterior fusions. And I'll show some of that tomorrow. We dissect the pleura over the just anterior to the rib head, we place the screws you know, transversely, you have to, you know, place them well, otherwise you're into the canal uh, or out the front into the aorta. So you've got to be just bicortical or just short and get good fixation. This is what it looks like intraoperatively. This patient had an internal 
thoracoplasty, so it's a little redder than normal, but there's very little bleeding, typically 100, 150 cc's a case or less. And then you can see what happens with growth modulation. This is a, a, a patient from Randy Betts where there's squaring of the vertebra even at one year. So there is really good growth modulation that occurs. But again, most of the deformity is in the disc. Amr, Simdani, and Randy's, uh, their first series was, uh, that was reported in the literature with two-year follow-up showed good proof of concept and good correction of the curves out to two years, but a small series. And then Peter Newton took a look out to as, as long as four years post-operative, and there's some return of the curve partially, but you know, largely it's the, the same kind of 50% correction, but a very high and unacceptable revision rate seven out of 17 patients, and only 59% were clinically successful. In other words, curves less than 35 degrees, and uh, four were either indicated or underwent a revision to a fusion, so a very high failure rate. And then another paper, a study in which Peter uh, looked at his own patients, tether versus fusion, and uh, less correction of the curve, almost a 40% revision rate for the tether patients. And, minimal for the uh, fusion. Um, but his patients, a lot of these uh, tether patients, they were less mature. Uh, almost 80% had open triradiate cartilage. So that's gonna be important later. And then you can see the difference between tether, fusion, um, and then what a revision looked like in Peter's hand. So here, I would say that that's part of the learning curve. He probably didn't tether all the involved levels and maybe, uh, you know, I think we learn a lot about when to intervene, size of the curve, flexibility, how much tensioning, how, what levels to instrument, and maybe some of this could be avoided. And maybe also tethering both sides in some cases. And then Dan Hornschmeyer presented a series, similar series to what Peter originally presented, also in JBJS, and he's got most of the patients with closed triradiate cartilage. So his success rate now increases, and that's for curves less than 30 degrees as opposed to 35. And his success rate now is 74% from uh, just over 50% in Peter's series. So it's not that Dan's a better surgeon than and Peter. It's just a different, slightly different group of patients. And this is proven by Alan A and uh, their group from Turkey showing that the mechanical complications over correction and uh, failure of screws, et cetera, is higher for the Sanders too, and it, it decreases dramatically for the more skeletally mature patients over correction, much higher for Sanders too, and as the patients mature, that's not really a problem. So I think that's largely where the, the bad outcomes center around. And then here, a much larger study in our uh, uh, harm study group where we presented 237 patients in a tether versus fusion arm. And again, we see just greater percentage correction, uh, a better overall, better job of uh, maintaining or correcting kyphosis, but not dramatically different. Uh, and success rates were higher in the fusion patients. And now reoperations, 16%. So 40% in Peter's uh, original, but in this multi-center study, some of the learning curve had already been gone through, the, the reoperation rate's much lower. We reported at two years uh, tether breakage of 27%, but really, despite this, and most of these were in the lumbar spine, so I think it takes time for the breakages to occur in the thoracic, so lumbar tethers will break sooner, and so we use a, a double row of screws in most of the cases now, and I think that will just you know, delay the breakage, it'll still occur but we didn't see a big difference in clinical success. So I think if you hold them straight enough, long enough, and delay the breakage, I think they, they can still do very well clinically. And here's a patient, 15 years old, uh, and here he is at five and a half years with breakages at every single level in the lumbar spine, but he's not fused now to L3 or L4. And there he is. So uh, sometimes the break in the tether is, uh, helps us uh, avoid failure. This young lady was going on to overcorrection, and we were going to have to go back and release the tether or remove it, and she broke fortuitously. And I think, you know, hopefully she'll break at that lower level, and she'll be just right. And she's, uh, she got her best time in the butterfly uh, on a national level in the Bahamas uh, following her operation.
And sometimes, like in this patient, we probably should have either done a hybrid from the get-go or tethered both curves bilaterally. And today I would have done a double row of screws in the lumbar, but she broke her lumbar tether and then her thoracic curve took off. So we revised her with fusion above and a double row of uh, screws below for tether. And then a lot of times we'll see a subtle overcorrection and they come to the finish line of growth and they're, you know, they hold up their alignment very nicely. So that's common. But other times there's this unpredictability. And I would say, this is not my particular case, but I've had similar cases. Uh, probably the curves are too small, number one. Maybe too much growth remaining in this child and probably should have been treated like a lanky 1B. Just tether the thoracic curve and gone a little longer and that might have been a better result. Um, so we, we've got to be cognizant of the power of this technique and where it can go wrong and I think we need to learn from this. Here's one of my patients where she had a significant proximal thoracic curve and um, I, you know, I told the family we're going to have probably to deal with the proximal curve and I said we could fuse above tether below or see how it goes and then we'll fuse above if need be. But she, she was lost to a COVID uh, pandemic and then came back with this, uh, you know, really out of whack spine. So we fused the thoracic spine and we just extended one level further or two levels further in the lumbar with tether. She's now approaching two years follow up and, and doing very well. So some of this is predictable. Uh, we reported on morbidity of the operation, anterior procedures, and this mirrors the anterior fusion literature, basically 184 patients. Um, we just looked at early follow-up, and we had a f three cases of chylothorax, I can talk about that, two of hemothorax, and one lumbar radiculopathy due a, to a screw tickling the foramen. Uh, so I'll switch gears just for another few minutes who is potentially a good candidate in the more mature population? Well, I think in the lumbar spine, uh, smaller flexible curves, some growth remaining is probably better than none. And we double up in the lumbar and even sometimes in the thoracic to just provide greater longevity. And you know, the families know there's limited data. We've published in not the mainstream journals because it's very controversial and I can't get it through. Um, but the parents tell us, you know, we prefer flexibility and growth and minimal scarring and shorter recovery time. That's why we chose VBT. I, I can always have a fusion, but can't go backwards. Um, lumbar fusion can cause adjacent segment degeneration. Uh, flexibility and minimal scarring uh, were the main factors in choice. So, you know, we're just listening to the families and here's a girl who's probably in most uh, series would not be operated. She's got bigger curves. Uh, PHOS is the proximal humerus ossification stage. She's at four, so it's equivalent to uh, Sanders, uh, uh, probably six or seven, and she's a RISR three. So most would not have operated on this uh, with tether, but we did bilateral and uh, double cords below. She's two years post-op. She's now at about three and a half years out. We've got excellent rotational correction, and she looks great. She's a volleyball player, and she didn't want a fusion, so uh, so far, so good, but time will tell. Similar uh, young lady here with uh, a thoracal lumbar tether. Time will tell how, how these hold up, but excellent rotational deformity. And even with breakage, we see some uh, return of the curve, but not to its previous magnitude. And then the rotational correction often will hold. I, we have a, a study in which we published on uh, thoracic uh, RISR 3 to five versus uh, zero, one, and two, and we just show better correction, but still pretty satisfactory uh, around 50% correction, even for mature patients. And just comparison of skeletally immature versus mature. So you can see better correction with growth modulation in the immature, but still reasonable uh, outcomes at two years. And again, time will tell. And then we published a series of patients out to five years uh, as long as five years, average three years, with a uh, very satisfactory coronal plane correction and reasonable maintenance of the, of the sagittal plane in skeletally mature. But again, we're not getting this into the mainstream journals just yet. So here's just bilateral tethers, immature versus mature, and you can see some breakages where the, the screws have splayed. And again, here, 
we learn a lot. I probably in that lower picture on the right, I would have uh, extended one level further and I would have added a double row of screws. But you know, this is uh, now several years ago. And here, breakages at two years at every level. Again, we're gonna double up the screws now and it'll hold it longer. But still, the, the young lady is holding a reasonable correction. There's a role, I think, in some patients for uh, a hybrid fusion tether. And that would be for triple curves, a curve in which you know, it's rigid, large, thoracic lordosis, large rib prominence would probably do a better job of predictably correcting that with uh, fusion. And uh, here's an example. And here's a patient with hypo, very significant hypokyphosis, and we wanted to restore her uh, lumbar, her thoracic spine, so we did that with a, a hybrid approach. So I think we'll end it there. Uh, I think the, the possibility of the triple aim of correction, some growth at least, flexibility is maintained with this. Uh, the key is really going to be to study these patients and compare them to fusion, but I think uh, we share what is known with the families, what is not known, and then it's up to the families to decide. Leave it there. <laughs> we hear you. There, there were staggering words of brilliance before you heard me. <laughs> but the, the real question is, uh, with regard to a predictive model, uh, it sounds like somebody between Sanders 3 and 5 bends out to less than 30 degrees. Uh, maybe the thoracolumbar curves have more of an advantage than the thoracic curves. Are you working on any kind of predictive models to see which cases are least likely to require revision or most likely to achieve the success criteria? Yeah, Sig, that's, those are really important points. And you know what we tell the families first and foremost is that the standard of care with excellent results, and I've done thousands of these operations myself, is fusion. And they're reliable and you know, uh, tether, especially if we're pushing the limits, either too young and small curve or too old and larger curves, are gonna be where we could get into trouble and we don't have the data. So I think it is important to generate that data. And I think uh, you know, larger data sets and machine learning is gonna be helpful. I know, I believe that um, the group in Montreal, Stéphane Perrant and his group are doing some of that work. Um, I know some of the companies are interested in doing that. So I think that will come in time. And we've spoken a lot about that. I think it is gonna be important I think if you capture them too young with too small a curve, we know for sure they're gonna overcorrect. And uh, we've uh, done a cadaver study where we figured out a way to percutaneously release the tether, but we haven't done any uh, clinical patients yet. So that might be an opportunity to, to go at it earlier, smaller curves, but then be able to release it uh, in a less invasive way uh, might be an, you know, a, a one opportunity, but we definitely need to generate the data. Great to be here with you, Sig. I've known Sig for almost 30 years now, so. Great, uh, great talk, Shane Birch. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of stuff to unpack in there. One, one of the questions I have, though, is what your thoughts are on where the um, mobility comes from. You talked a lot about flexibility, lateral bending, forward flexion, extension, and where do you think that mobility comes from? Is it a shorter construct? Is there a loosening of the screw bone interface? Um, you know, is it less scar tissue? Um, you know, you also have to get rid of your jacket too, by the way. Yeah. You know, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, I, no, that's a great question. So I think from the cadaver study, for example, where and even the bending uh, radiographic uh, bending data that Noel Larson has shown and we're gonna present some of that with the harm, uh, harm study group. I think Michelle Marks has taken the lead in that. When we just look at the segments with, that are instrumented, there's motion within those segments. So flexion, extension, and lateral bend. Um, and then, so, and, and I don't see, it's not loosening. There doesn't appear to be a halo effect. Uh, having gone back on a few cases, those screws are rock solid. And I've never seen, I've seen some screws plow and I've seen some pull back at surgery, and then they don't budge. They just, there's, they're coated with hydroxyapatite, and they seem to just, you know, there's incorporation around the screws, and, and they're very fixed. So it's not there. Um, I, sure, in some cases there's breakage of the tether, but we can kind of have a sense of that if there's a splaying of the screws, and we can predict that maybe there was a breakage. 
I think most of it's within the disc and the, uh, the motion segments preserved, especially in the sagittal plane, axial plane, a little less so in lateral bending, as you might expect. But it's, it's preserved within those segments. There's play in the system then, right? So there's, like in the construct, it's not a rigid construct. There's, a, there's play. Right. And if you compress the patient, you can obviously compress the cord. And, then, and that's where you're getting your flexibility? Well, you know, if you, you can imagine a string here, you, you shouldn't have much effect on flexion and extension. Um, probably not so much an axial rotation, but bend away from that, that's going to be a check rein here. Mm -hmm. uh, and it appears to be not very much, but yes, you're right. With compression of the disc, there's some shortening of the tether and some slack, and then it allows you to bend a little because it doesn't completely go away. I think uh, Trobish with a double row tether in the cadaver showed 45% loss away from the tether. So probably it's some of that compression within the disc, yes. Dr. Lawner, uh, great talk. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's certainly, I think as Sig mentioned, and the thoracolumbar, lumbar spine, the advantage of not, um, you know, fusing those vertebra with uh, tethering. Anterior tethering, I think some of us fear that it can be sort of kyphogenic. Is that sort of your experience? And how do you avoid uh, kyphogenesis in the thoracolumbar yeah. spine? There, is there a limit to how low you'll go as, yeah. as you go lower, you need even more lower doses getting yeah. down to three and four? It's true. Uh, we go to L4 as needed. I think if we go short, you can see some of that sagging that I showed in a couple of my earlier cases. Yeah. So it just looks better and I think is better overall long term uh, to go to, you know, include the levels that have to be included. And uh, even with the double row of screws, we're not seeing uh, loss of lower doses. And we've looked at that data in some of our series. I've got, I, uh, tomorrow I'll show some of it in my lanky 5.6 talk where I'll show some VBT. Uh, they seem to be maintaining very well, actually. Okay. Um, so it hasn't been a problem. Just like with anterior fusions, I think if, well, if you place that first screw, the posterior screw is nice and posterior, and you're tensioning there, it seems to hold up just fine. But it's a good, good question, point. Steve. For that talk. Uh, question in regards to uh, the hybrid technique uh, for double major curves yeah. versus all tether. What, what, what kind of uh, things do you consider in choosing whether to go a hybrid or just a double tether? So, Steve, you know, as you know, some of these patients have very severe thoracic curves and a, a more moderate, you know, 50, even 60, 65 degree lumbar, but that's relatively flexible. So if, you know, we're not going to get a reliable correction. And I've, I've done some cases where I took on a curve that was too large and the patient didn't do as well. So, you know, learn from that. Um, I think we want a reliable result, as good a long-term result as possible. So if we can correct and maintain the thoracic spine forever, and that will induce a partial correction on the lumbar spine, which will take some of the tension off the, the lumbar tether, and then we get her, you know, the patient nice and straight, uh, even with, you know, after the growth spurt, but double tether. I think a lot of those will hold up fairly well over time. And what we tell the families is, um, you know, it may require a revision at some point. It may not stand the test of time. And if, if we were making these decisions from the uh, healthcare policymakers, we probably wouldn't even be doing any of these cases. We'd just be doing the fusions maybe delaying them into adulthood. Um, but with the luxury of being able to have this decision making, I think uh, they, they're very well aware that there is going to be a revision rate here and some of the patients will require it. They also know that, you know, I could foresee a future where even some adults get a lumbar tether. Uh, the tethers are going to be stronger. The engineers tell us four times stronger in the future. They're still going to break. But if you have a double row, it's eight times stronger. And if we can hold it for 10 years instead of five years, maybe part of the correction will hold and they don't need a extensive fusion or a revision fusion to the sacrum and pelvis. So it's kind of kicking the can down the road and hoping to avoid it. So from a health policy standpoint, that's probably not gonna be the answer, but uh, in an individual uh, 
patient family decision making, that's what they consider. Question, and that is uh, for the failures, single or double, are the failures caused by the same mechanism or are they different with single versus double? Is it usually um, for the single versus double mid substance or at the screw uh, um, tether interface? What are your thoughts? Uh, there's some patterns, Steve. I think uh, in the lumbar spine where there's more motion, it t tends to be mid sub between the screws in the middle, between the screws in the uh, tether. Um, in the thoracic spine where there's less movement, it tends to be adjacent to the screw, right adjacent to the screw. Um, that's where it is. It hasn't been a bone screw interface failure. Uh, it hasn't been the screws breaking. It, it's, it's really been that tether breakage. And it depends where it is. You know, in lumbar, it's going to be more mid-substance. Yeah. Great.